Hey everyone and welcome to Almost Cancelled, I'm Peter, that is Connor and we are going to talk about Twin Peaks The Return Part 8, full spoilers for the episode as always. Well honestly Connor, I think we can just pack up and go home, I don't think we even have to talk about the rest of the episodes, I feel like this episode clearly explained everything, we're done. Uh, the rest of it's just going to be sort of some fodder, I think. Uh, I mean, it's, it's done. It, it definitely explained uh, a lot of the backstory. It was straightforward, nothing confusing about it, uh, you know, in and out. But done. Simple. Do you know what? You're being sarcastic, but I think a lot of it was, you know, relatively D to the point. No, I mean, I'm being sarcastic mainly because, you know, you see a lot of reactions online. You see people going, oh my God, what am I watching? This is insane. Wow, 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 wow. Once you cut through the, the artsy bullshit of it and go, oh, that's what that is. I don't, I don't mean that derivatively. I just mean, you know, once you get to the point of going, okay, that's what that is. That's what that's saying. That's what that's saying. It's like, okay, it, it makes a lot of sense. I don't know what I hear the word bullshit about this show <laughs> once again. Do you understand me? With bullshit the, is not a, a bad term when I say it. With the possible exception of maybe the length of a certain musical performance. I'll maybe accept it in that one instance. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, there was no bullshit in this episode. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to get into it. got my notes, as we've, as we've been doing. Uh, before we actually talk about end this episode, I just wanted to bring up uh, a couple of points from last week. What One thing we missed... And I'm ashamed of missing this. Like, I am absolutely saddened to my core. Remember 430. Yeah. That number came up last week. We didn't notice it. Did it? Andy was told to meet someone at 430. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if that counts for it or not. It may not be the instance which is important, but I do think it's... I think we should have noticed that we should have went, no wait, 4 3 oh, I think it's worth mentioning. Mm, that's, that's fair. I, I think it's because, you see, the way we saw 4 3 oh was 430, not split as 4 oh, I, I never saw it as anything in particular. My mind was open for any possibility. It wouldn't surprise uh, me if when we finally see it, it'll be reflected backwards in Roman numerals and set on fire. And set on fire. And set on fire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, up to that point, I was like, yeah, you know, that, that would be hidden, but it's there. And then it's like, nah, set on fire. I want you to see it. Uh, also, the other thing, at the end of the episode last last time, the uh, character ran into the diner and shouted a name. Uh, we were fairly con convinced it was Bing. Uh, interestingly, I did note that my first time watching it, I thought I heard uh, Millie. Turns out the name was actually Billy. Someone told us that in the comments. I actually went back and I listened to it very closely, multiple times, listening for what it was. It is definitely Billy. The confusion, I think, is that there is a character in the credits credited as Bing. Ah. But it's not Bing. It's definitely Billy. I, I went yeah, back multiple times. Well, it sounded a bit... Well, I mean, the fact that we're having the, the discussion yeah. as to what it was was, but was very important I, I, it wasn't I did, I did feel a bit lot, lot more vindicated, though, because I wasn't completely bananas when I thought I heard Millie. At yeah, least you weren't that far off. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, B Bing plus Millie, we get Billy. So, we, we got there in the end. So, that, that was the two, two key points from the last episode that I wanted to sort of address, uh, corrections as it were, uh, to begin to, to begin the show. Um, Alright, so we started with Doppelcoop and Ray uh, driving from the prison. Uh, my first, first point here is there was some nice synth music playing throughout this entire segment especially when they got to the part where they went off off the highway and it was just like you know the headlights like in the dirt road kind of yeah. like horror vibes and like the synth was going oh it was very moody very atmospheric loved it um but no i, I did note down this license plate from the truck in front of them which i, am, I did as well I, I am almost positive this is not important at all do you know but, what i wrote it down before he even texted it <laughs> 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 that's how much i was on it for that i was like i don't i don't think i'm gonna need this but just in case and then he texted it i was like oh oh maybe i will need this because he's talking about there would be multiple trackers and it seems like he's thrown it off by like rerouting something with this license plate or some such I, i'm not mm -hmm. going to pretend to understand exactly what he's doing but that, that was the gist i got of it uh but for the record d e e g w a for the record uh, and is it is it even worse that when I looked at that I went, is that kind of saying Doogie? Digwe? Digwe? <laughs> and it doesn't, it doesn't, I'm just, I'm just, 
I'm off my off my head. And honestly, for this episode, that's probably a good thing. Uh, because I'm going to keep referring to this opening chunk of the episode as the normal portion of the episode. Uh, it almost feels boring by comparison to the events that transpire later and, on. And that's it. And if this had been in any other episode, we'd have been like, oh, there's so much to go on here. You know, like this section of the episode, there's like, oh, this, there's there's plenty to, to delve into and discuss. Oh, yeah. But no, the meat comes later. But that said, there's a lot of interesting things to point out here. Um, so Ray's still got all those numbers that the Doppelcoop wanted, and he tries to extort them for more money. He's like, you know, I think they're worth money. Uh Double cut the entire time. Like, oh, do you know? And I'm like, oh, his days are numbered. I say days, like minutes are numbered. Like, double cut's <laughs> going to kill you because he's asking about Daria, and he's like, oh, she's waiting for a phone call. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, After life, sure. Um, but interesting point. So, so they eventually pull over, right? It, it does mention that they want to go to a place called the farm. That's where yes. Ray's going. That's where he wants to go. And he, he does reiterate later on in another phone call. He says that he knows where he's going. So clearly, the farm is where he's heading. Uh, but when they pull over, when they when they go down this dark road and they, they pull over because Ray wants to take a piss, I do. This is something in particular my second viewing that I because I think in my first viewing like the events played out and I'd kind of forgotten about this moment. But Doppelcoop does check the gun. He pulls the gun yeah. out of the glove, the glove box and he checks it. There's bullets in that chamber. Yeah, yeah, he definitely checks yeah. it. I, I just I, I think I think my mind glossed over it the first time because oh, the scene played out and then it was oh yeah I've tricked you asshole and he turns around and Ray shoots him instead because the gun doesn't fire. Uh, and obviously there's other ways you could probably trick the gun and whatever, but I just I thought that was very interesting just from a... Yeah, whatever. If this is just a fake, it's a very good looking, you know, fake that... Because even, even blanks would still fire. Right, exactly. Yeah. But no, this was this was not... A, the gun sort of jammed. I, I guess maybe you can, like, jam yeah, a gun. Yeah, I guess he's jammed yeah. it, but then would it not backfire? I don't know enough about firearms to <laughs> give you an answer I, I to just, that question. I, I would have assumed if it jammed, because the gunpowder still getting hit would still, you know, explode, mm-hmm. it would backfire, is what my assumption would be. Yeah. But, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but I, I, I did think that was interesting. It made me, I actually started theorising in my head, like, did, did like did the warden go to Ray and, like, the warden told him everything about the conversation with Doppelcoop, and Ray's like, right, give him the gun, but make it sure it's a dud, and give me a real gun so that I've already got. Because he already had it on him. Like, he had that on his persons. And he yeah. and we seen him leave the prison last episode. They didn't, they didn't seem to have went anywhere else. That they've run the road That's since. it. It's like, when did this swap happen, other than, like, if it wasn't a swap? Because we never see them alone. You know, yeah. like they're always together from the moment they're out of the prison. So I, I think the wardens who gave him the gun, it's like he's hoping that Ray's going to take him out. Cause Solve his problem. Yeah, exactly. He's worried about what Doppelkip knows about Mr. Strawberry and all the rest of it. Um, But yeah, so I think oh, this is the first, like, oh shit moment of the episode is that he turns around and he shoots Doppelkip and Doppelkip goes down. And you're yeah. like, wait, what? What's happening? What? And then things get, get weird. Uh, <laughs> so we start getting lightning. So there's flashing. Again, very in- indicative of all of, uh, you know, lodge activity, presences from the lodge in some capacity. And then the charcoal men, not man, multiple charcoal individuals. Uh, I've seen other people online call them soot men, you know, because they're covered in soot. Um, I'm sticking with charcoal, though. I feel like charcoal's a, a good name charcoal, for Charcoal, so it's basically the same thing. Um but they, they they all come out, but they're not they're not like they're kind of there, but they're not. They're kind of fading in and out, and they're flickering, and they're like kind of ghosty. Yeah, uh, it really reminds me of a scene that comes later, actually. The the, the way that this plays out, mm-hmm. it's uh, the scene in front of the gas station. We'll we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Let's yeah, not, let's not jump ahead. But yeah, um, so interesting thing. So this plays out for a while. Like Lynch likes to do, he likes to draw out the moments, and there's a lot of Ray like sort of being confused and watching in horror. Understandably so. <laughs> Understandably, and uh, there was a quick shot of like Doppelcoop, and I'm like, "Is this stomach moving there? There's something about it coming out of his stomach." But then it cut away, and it you know more weirdness, more weirdness, and then it came back, and then eventually, yeah, there is something coming out of his stomach. The the charcoal men are taking something out of it, and we see this sort of black ball, but yeah. inside the ball is a face. Mm. The face of Bob. Yeah, so the implication here is that they have just taken Bob away from Doppelcoop. They've taken Bob away from Doppelcoop. And at this point in the episode, I was thinking that they are working for the Lodge and they're bringing him back. 
the, uh... yeah, my my assumption here was okay. Doppelkoop's dead. We need to keep Bob back. You know, we need the spirit back. My, my interpretation has completely changed once we got to the end of the episode. But at this point in the episode, that's yeah. what I was thinking. I was thinking they are acting. Good's maybe not the right word, but they're, they're, they are protectors of the lodge and they are taking them back there. They are like, the enforcers, mm. if, if you will, uh, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's kind of where I was going with it. But Ray, of course, he, he gets away, he goes into the car and he's, 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 he's on the phone uh, to Philip. He says the name Philip. Now, obviously, our heads yeah. all jump to Philip Jeffries. Yeah, it's the, the only... I mean, this is the thing. Lynch likes to do this a lot with peaks where there's multiple characters with the same names. So you can never just assume who one is talking to, of even course, if they say a name. We, we we do have reasonable circumstances here, though, because we did have Doppelkoop also talk to... And yes. he gave his full name. Like The full name was mentioned the last time, and Doppelkoop spoke to someone named Philip Jeffries. So yeah. we, ha- we have some reason to expect it is. But uh, What I thought was interesting, though, is he, t- he tells Philip... Uh, he saw something come out of him that may be the key to what this is all about. Mm. I thought it was very interesting. It was like, so does Philip not know what it's all about? Or or, is, or maybe Philip does, but Ray didn't know what it was about, and he's, he's maybe starting to put pieces together. I, I'm more inclined to think that I think Philip Jeffries, from what we saw of him, was mm. a bit more on the ball. And I think he probably knows, but he's been keeping things to himself. Po- yeah, very possibly. Um but yeah, it, it, like it really sounds like it's beyond just because I think with the, the first episode or the second episode with Daria, and it kind of just felt like someone put a hit on him. Whereas here, it feels like there's more of a kind of in depth conspiracy, yeah, going on rather than just oh Philip Jeffries put a hit for them to kill him. It feels like they're more involved in some way, even if they don't really know the extent of everything that is happening. Mm. Uh, but not interesting. Yeah, I wonder if if he knew that you know killing Doppelkoop would cause this to happen like if he knew that this was the way to separate him from Bob and maybe that's why he put the hit out yeah mm, yeah I, I could see it uh, then we, we we cut to the roadhouse and well first of all so we already had the shock of uh, Cooper getting shot and then the shock of seeing the Bob face and the sort of the black glowing ball and then it cuts to the roadhouse and the, the sort of the presenter says and welcome to the Roadhouse, the Nine Inch Nails. And I just started laughing. I'm like, what? Uh, yeah. Joe, like, there's been recognisable names in the in the past few episodes. Not Nine know, Inch Nails level. But, but not this, no. <laughs> and I thought it was very notable how they were the only one to get an introduction as well. They got an introduction. Now, I'm not surprised in the grand scheme of things, because Lynch has directed Nine Inch Nails like, music videos. So he knows the yeah. band. And Trent Reznor, I think, has is involved in the season in some capacity. Uh, so it's not like all that weird in sense of that he has the connections to pull this off, but there's just something so surreal about this little bar in this small town of Twin Peaks somehow having the Nine Inch Nails for one night. Yeah. In, in my head, in this universe, uh, it's you know Nine Inch Nails aren't that big. Sure, sure, okay. <laughs> it's the only way, it's the only way I can justify it. What I, what I do like about this though is that Nine Inch Nails does feel like the perfect metal band for uh, David Lynch material for some reason because they have a really unique sound to them. The sound kind of yeah. off, you know, off the mainstream, off the beaten path. Well, that's that's, that's Reznor in a nutshell, isn't it? <laughs> and his name, he, his name's Reznor for a start. Well, I mean, yeah, but everything he's... Nine Inch Nails is probably my least favourite of his projects, but it's it's still got that sort of edge that a lot of his other stuff does, where it's just just not quite right. Yeah, I, I like... I, he's got a good voice. I like a lot of... Uh, I, like, I like a few Nine Inch Nails. I'm not like a big fan. Like, I've got the greatest hits, and the greatest hits is... Enough for me. I don't need the individual yeah. albums kind of thing. Uh, but I've got a few good songs I like. Uh, but no, uh, so yeah, if I have one complaint, is that this, we basically get the whole song, from what I can tell. It feels like the whole song. Yeah, it is. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe that went on a bit too long. I see. Sm- I don't sm- have a problem with it for one reason. Oh, go on. The fact is, this is the exact same as what we get at the end of every normal is, episode. Which I actually do want to talk about. I want to talk about how this is lynched into the audience. That as far as you're concerned, even though we're only like 10, 15 minutes in, this is the end of what you think of as a normal episode of Twin Peaks. Right, exactly. Which is why I think it plays out the full, you know, three yeah. minute odd whatever. Oh, no, that's because fair. that's that's what always happens at the end of the, the episode. It's I'll admit, just... it never bothered me, because I've watched this twice, like I've been doing with all these episodes. It never bothered me the first time, it was the second time, I'm like, alright, alright, okay, I get it, the full song. Get, get yeah, to the yeah, next yeah. thing. Yeah, but to be fair, you said that about the guy sweeping the floor before. 
That is also true. That is also so, true. So, you know, I think it's just a case of some of these things, they go on a long time. They sit there where you're waiting for the point, which is fine on a first watch. Yeah. Because you're waiting. That said, I don't want to complain that much because I did like the performance. I like the song. I like the lighting and the performance. Yeah, uh, it was pretty cool. So, not all good. Then it comes to Doppelcoop. He wakes up. He sits up. And that's it. <laughs> like The Undertaker. Which you won't get that reference, but other people will. Um, he sits up. Like Michael Myers, actually, because Undertaker based out of Michael Myers. So, I'll, I'll reference it to... The, the, oh, okay. The, I can put it in context now. Yeah, the true king. The true king of the sitting up in a creepy manner. Um... But yeah, he, he wakes up, and that, so before we even get to the rest of it, where things get really wild, it's like, okay, so Bob's not there anymore, but he's still Doppelkoop, right? He's going to be pissed when he finds out, because oh. there was that, you know, that was that moment, I don't know, it was last episode, the one before, where he looked in before, the mirror, yeah. and he goes, oh good, you're still with me. Yeah, so, I mean, that I think that, A, showed that he was still there, but B, it showed that he, he, he could not be like he could be yeah, double yeah, he was Bob. aware this was a possibility yeah uh, so he might be very upset by this and it, it leads me to wonder like does this have any effect on real Cooper this 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 happenings yeah does it because remember uh, one our man did say one of you has to die no technically he's not dead yet so fair but that, that's the question but did he die and then like, was he dead long enough for it to count I don't know. Because uh, that, that, for all intents and purposes, he looked dead. Obviously, we we no no one examined him to say, yeah, this man's dead. Well, we had a lot of charcoal men like digging into his stomach because because as one of the things that I really noticed about because obviously it was kind of it was intentionally hard to tell because it was a lot of like yeah. frantic moving like ghosty hands and stuff. But you could sort of see them smearing blood all over his face and yeah, like, you know, very, very very grotesque looking stuff. But no, uh, by the way, I just I just want to say the the Bob bubble. When he comes out and he's just got that s- evil smile, oh, it's glorious! Like I smiled so much. Yeah, I smiled so it. much. It's it, pretty great. It's so great that even though we don't have the actor around, that we're still making him such an integral. Like, his presence is still felt so Absolutely. much. Absolutely, it's great. It's, it's the show doesn't work without him. It's great. Uh, now here's what here's what I want to say about the next thing. Connor, was there any part of your body that was prepared for the text that appeared on the screen next? That text being July 16, 1945, White Sands, New Mexico, 5.29am. Was there any part of your body that was prepared for that? No. I was like, okay, Lynch, you cock-teasing prick. Because that's that's basically what it was. You know, we got, oh, Doppelcoop alive Mm -hmm. after that. Bob's gone. What's going to happen next? And it's like, eh, see you in I, a few weeks, losers. I, I cannot... I, I don't think I can articulate the feeling of when it cut to a black and white image. I'm like, oh, black and white? Oh, what's this mean? Because you know, obviously I'm thinking, okay, thematically, why is he turning... Why is he going black and white? What, yeah. what is this going to be thematically saying? And then it just boldly, big giant text on the screen, 1945, and I'm like, holy shit, what is going on? Like, what is... You know, I sat up. Like, I sat up, and I'm like, what is happening? And... Do you remember episode four, episode five, whenever we saw the office and we were like, oh, that, that giant nuclear explosion behind behind Cole's desk. Yeah. And we sort of like, we sort of joked, oh, I wonder if that's meaning something, if that's hinting towards something. And then we get this operatic, very slow track in to an explosion, a nuclear explosion, presumably the first one in 1945. Yeah, it, it looks like the, the first test. The, the very first, yeah, successful test. And here's where I want to... I want to correct something we've been saying all season. And it's not a big correction. We're still right, I think. But I just want to change a word. I just want to change one word. Go on. We, we, have, we have constantly been talking about how inhabitants of the Lodge, Cooper get in and out, other beings get in and out, have been going through electricity. I want to change that word. I want to change the word electricity to energy. Yeah, I knew, I knew you were going with that, yeah. I want because... This is hard. It's always funny because th- th- this gets very 2001. It gets very going through the infinite... Yeah. You know, psychedelic because it gets all those things and it's amazing to me how much this made sense to me well that's it that, that's what i was saying <laughs> at the start you know when she when yeah. she cut through the arty bullshit because what, what that's that's almost what some of this is it's just a, a covering to hide it but really it's quite simple for a lot of it it, it is I, I don't want to 
Like, I think it'd be boring, though, if there was no art oh, scene. It would to... it would be a boring yeah. to, to watch, don't get me wrong. This is purely just... visual. Because this is the thing I want to point out as well, is that from this point on, from the moment that text comes up on screen in uh, 1945, there is no dialogue for maybe 30 minutes. Yeah, it's a long time. It's, it's the boy and the girl, right, is the next dialogue. Yeah, and it's largely black and white as well for those 30 minutes. Yes. So, very, very key moments that aren't. Yeah, which, by the way, as soon as it went black and white, I started getting uber eraser head feelings. Uh, I'm saying it now, we're doing that in flux before Twin Peaks is finished. I, I, I want to rewatch that. <laughs> we'll see. We're doing a razor head in, in flux in the next two months. I mean, you say that, but I would rather not in the sense that I want to prolong the amount of Lynch I've got. Because <laughs> yeah, I've not seen that. But it's I don't want to waste it all in one go. Yeah, but, but, but we've done... What well, well, we done in the in the time that since we started doing Twin Peaks, we've done that. We've done Bull and Drive. We've done this. You know what? I want to do a Lynch after. I, want, all, I don't want it all at once. We also did June. We did uh, June as well. Yeah, forgot about yeah, that one. Yeah, we did Mulholland Drive. Did Fireball with me. And I get I get what you're saying, right? But I do want to do a Razor Head again. I feel like thematically, there's some things I want to go back and just. Check. Well, we'll we'll talk about that after Twin Peaks then, because at least then I'm extending the Lynch. I don't want it all in that that same time frame. <laughs> he wants to extend the Lynch. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so I've got I've got obviously got a lot of notes here. I've got yeah, black and white, include explosion, long haunting track up. I love that. I love the music that was playing, which is a source track. I can't remember the title of it off my head, top of my head. Um, Connor's advertising Kit Kat again, as he's done a few times. I, I tried not to. But. Yeah. Um, so we see a series of images. So after, after the slow track into the explosion, it's like we go into the explosion and we see various things happening. Very, very abstract, of course. We see specks, we see flames, we see clouds. Uh, as time goes on, they get more violent. They're very kind of like, very calm S- at Yeah, first. and they become almost like storms. Yeah. And then, then it goes pink. And I thought that was very interesting. Because so obviously we had the pink world, the pink ocean before. Uh, so it was very pink at one point. I thought that was very interesting. Um, it also gets darker as well after that, as it goes as well. So again, the idea that it's getting more sort of violently erratic and darker and more evil, more sinister. Uh, and then it goes back to black and white eventually as well. And this is, this is a good long time. This is a good five minutes of this music playing with all these things happening. And it's very, like I say, it's very 2001 Space Odyssey. It's very good into the void, that moment in that movie. Uh, and I think that makes a lot of sense. And... I thought I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait just now before I talk about what I think this all is. Uh, no, no, I won't. Right. That's <laughs> so. It will. It's more clear with the next couple of parts. But what what essentially we're seeing is is this was what opened a pathway to the Black Lodge. Right. This this horrific event. Yeah. You know, like potentially there's one of the the worst moments in human history. The, the, the invention of the the most destructive thing we have. Well, there's, there's two key things here, right? One, we've heard in the past about trying to get to the Black Lodge, it's acts of violence to open it up, acts of evil right. and violence and that kind of thing. And then the other thing we've just been talking about is that what lets them travel is energy. And what is an explosion when you boil it down to its simplest thing? It is a release of energy. What is yeah. the biggest release of energy? But what is the biggest explosion? The very first nuclear bomb detonation. Yeah, it's, it's abundantly clear that this is ripping open the 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 portal between them yeah and i think presumably for the first time in 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 history there's may, maybe been you know not quite meetings it throughout history but i think maybe this is the first time that the portal's properly opened well i think i think there was probably some kind of interaction before but i think this opened a door that shouldn't have been there like like whatever mm. interaction there was before between the lodges and earth it was kind of the way it was supposed to be, but this created a, a backdoor. This created something that shouldn't exist, and it allowed the you know the events to start to domino that led to what's going on. My, my question is: Does it give the Black Lodge an advantage over the White? Because possibly, uh, yeah. obviously, it's never really confirmed. They're like at war with each other, but they're they're, they're diametrically opposed by their nature. They're black yeah. and white. Well, so there should be some sort of balance. I'll more on that in a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've got thoughts yeah. related yeah, to something yeah, else. Yeah, me too. Um, but yeah, so there, then we cut. So we're back to black and white, and we cut to a, a convenience store. Yeah, or more specifically, a gas station. But the reason why I'm because cu- you remember back in the original show, they often talked about uh, Bob and Mike live together above the convenience store in the apartment above 
the gas station, right? That yeah. was the thing. And it was a gas station, but there's a convenience... You can, see, you can clearly see a sign saying convenience store, so it's obviously acting as both. Yeah, a lot of them do. Yeah, obviously, yeah, it's very common. Um, and we see that. Uh, we go very stuttery. If you remember in the, the fireplace room in the pink world, yeah, you know, uh, we had a lot of stuttering, we had all that stuff going on. Um, it stutters kind of like that. It's, it's a little bit more... It's like the jumps in time are bigger, I'd say here, because when it goes back, when you see the smoke coming out the the building, yeah, it, it completely disappears. goes back in. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know it, the jumps are bigger, and this is all happening. And then eventually, you see the charcoal men all kind of stuttering around in front of the building, and a couple of the key pieces where I was kind of like, where my mind was going here was like, all right, so this is the creation of the the path to the Black Lodge, but it's also. The reason why, you know, and obviously in Fire Walk With Me, we actually seen a bunch of Lodge characters in this apartment above the, the convenience store. You know, mm. we actually saw that. So why is it, uh, why, why, why does part of the Lodge take the appearance of this place? And it's because I think that a lot of these beings were born and this convenience store was near the explosion. And this yeah. was like, this was like, and I think the charcoal men, I think they are people who, I don't know, I've heard speculation that people thought they were miners who were near the explosion or something like that, you know, when it went off, and mm. it, it created them from that, and that's why they're, 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 they're linked to it, and I'm not sure if I go that far, but the fact that we're seeing them in front of it does tie them to the creation of all this happening, and it's, you Absolutely. Know, uh, and I, I thought that was very fascinating, uh, but yeah, that that's why it's... Like, an, a, an apartment above a convenience store because that's where it all started. That's you know that's when the door was opened. Right, and I think here is the where it gets a bit timey wimey. Okay. Because uh, the the actions are kind of moving around, and it kind of looks similar to you know what we saw when they were there taking removing Bob from Doctor mm-hmm. Who. And also the the bit that really tipped me off is the smoke, because the smoke re- uh, came in when they were there as well. For Doppelcoop. we didn't mention it during the time, but uh, like it's it's very smoky all of a sudden at, at that point. You're, no, you're right, yeah. So I was thinking, and obviously, you know, they weren't quite there; they were like just half there, like they were coming from another time, perhaps. So I think maybe this is while they're like it is the opening of the lodge. They're also harvesting Bob from the future. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. I yeah. See. Okay. Which also plays into something that's coming up. Um. Okay, I, I can see, I can see. And there was also flickering uh, as this scene went on as well. Because uh, the music stopped, the flickering started. Uh, also, the, not not just the stuttering, but even the camera movement. We started cutting in close very erratically and yeah. cutting back. Uh, so again, it, it gave that very sort of uh, staccato kind of feel to the, the movement, which uh, mm. makes it feel very unsettling. Uh, but no, certainly... That was the big thing for me here, me here though, was that, no, this is why, why, why they, in, in, from the start of the show, why we're talking about a convenience store. This is why. That, this, it was here. This was the place that it's based on. Joe, uh, something else I noticed as well, you know, we were talking about the, the farm. Uh, Big mm-hmm. Ed's gas station was, was called the far, Big Ed's uh, farm station or something. It, it had the, the farm in it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So we end that scene and we, we cut to a more sort of, very simple, kind of cloudy, but not not like super detailed sort of void. Just kind of an empty space almost. It's kind of slight lighting, slight purpley lighting, but not much. Very, very yeah. muted. And we see a being. A monster, yes. if you will. Uh, in this. And this is where a lot of things from this season sort of click together. Uh, yeah. In and, and a lot of ways. So, this looks like the thing that was in the glass box. Yeah, that's that's why I thought too. First, first and foremost, it looks like the thing that was in the glass box, um, and the other thing here that really sticks because I actually I've got a little bit of additional knowledge here uh, from from the the book from the uh, the secret history of Twin Peaks from Mark Frost, which references a creature called Babylon, who is known as the mother of all abominations, and obviously that made me think about earlier on the season. Uh, when Cooper was in the, the, the fireplace room in the purple place and the character who was there said, hurry, mother is coming. She re- referenced a character called Mother, which actually backs up something I said uh, back in like episode three when I, I, I speculated that this being was in the box because it was it was chasing Cooper and yeah. then it chased him to this room as well and that's why it's banging on the door. It's trying to get to Cooper in time before he can get out. Like It's yeah, actually did, yeah. it's hunting him down. So... 
Now, admittedly, we didn't get this character, this being named in the show. In fact, I think in the credits, it's listed as Experiment. That's what it's credited as. Right, okay. Um, but certainly, this seems... The, the fact that we've heard the word mother before, the fact that we see it give birth, we're getting to that in a second. Yeah. Uh, the fact, All this stuff, the fact that we have all this, it really hints that the, the, the character who's referenced in that book, Babylon, the mother of all abominations, this seems to be that thing. That This is this creature. This creature takes advantage of this opening to birth things into the world. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely Mother from what I was seeing. Yeah. And of course, we then see a, a string of things coming out of this, this out of Mother's yeah, mouth. It, it, it vomits, basically. Yeah, it, it's vomiting a bunch of stuff. We see a lot of little egg things and whatnot. But we also see orbs. One in particular, a black orb with a face in it. The face of Bob. Hmm. We so in this episode now. If you'd asked me before this episode, oh, what do you think you're going to see in this week's Twin Peaks? I don't think the the sentence, the birth of Bob, with what what came out of my mouth. It almost certainly would not have been. But here we are. We we see the birth of Bob. Bob, Bob was just created. Yeah, and uh, I want to say that I still think the lodges existed long before this. I think. Oh yeah, it's no, I agree. Just, just this this. Opening of the portal is when Bob was born. Uh, Bob was born alongside the this act of violence. Like he's yeah. like the ultimate manifestation of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Not for a second do I think the lodges didn't exist before before this, and that makes sense with what we see in a minute. Uh, yeah. But like, yeah, the, the the fact that he like just the fact that he exists from now that when when mankind reach the 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 utmost climax of what its its violent potential could be in terms of like a single you know yeah, act peak of destruction. destructive capabilities yeah there you go uh it's fantastic uh so right what else have we got written down for this so the music comes back in uh we then start to have violent explosions again on screen just the clouds yep. and explosions and things happening um we then see a gold bubble form Mm. Obviously, somewhat reminiscent of like, the gold ball that Doogie turned into, and other things we've seen. Uh, the black box, you know, the receiver also turned into a gold ball, kind of. Yeah. Uh, so very reminiscent of these things. Uh, so we see that, and then now I don't think the way I interpret this is that I don't think something's been created here per se. Maybe there's a portal to the White Lodge as well, but to me, this is like okay, wherever the Black Lodge is coming from. There's also something else in here. It's, the, it's a path to the White Lodge. Because then it feels like the camera goes into it, and then we have all these particles like going through. It's almost like... Uh, it's almost like blood cells at first, the way it's like flying past the screen. Mm. And then it felt more like a, a sea, and then eventually it actually faded into an ocean, and it was the purple ocean from the purple yeah, world that we've seen. Yeah, suddenly you realise, oh, these are the purple waves. Yeah, exactly. It sort of slowly transitions into that. And you realise, and that's when, you know, it stops being black and white there for a sec. Obviously, it stopped being black and white when the explosions came into it, because uh, that's when colour kind of returned. Uh, but, like, and we're, we're in this purple ocean, and you see this sort of mountain, this lone little island of a mountain off in the distance. And at first I'm like, oh, that can't be where Cooper was, because Cooper was in, like, a, a balcony. But as we got closer, again, it's a very slow, long track in and then sort of track up. Uh, and you're like, oh, there's a building at the top. Oh, that I think that was, like, a balcony there. That Cooper yeah, was it looks because obviously when we saw it before where Cooper was in it, it looked like it was just floating. Yeah, we never saw anything like down below the building. Yeah, we never saw any of it. It may have been there, but we never it saw it. Been. We didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I, th- I think when he like, stepped out into that outer box, that was like weird, wimy things happening where he's he's not really there anymore. Yeah, kind of thing. Uh, but th- that that. Like so, obviously, I'm getting excited. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of kind of. No, we're still in the past. It's very, it's very clear, especially since later on we get like another t- timer coming up saying what year it is. Uh, so it makes sense that it's not in the future and that. But it's very clear from the rest of the scene that we're still, we're still 1945. We're still at the same moment. Yeah. And we go inside a slot in the wall. We go inside to in, into the building, and I just want to point out actually the shot as well, uh, sort of tracking in and going up it. It's very low angle the whole time. It makes the whole place feel like it's very important. Mm, definitely. You know, it feels like this is a place of power, a place of uh, importance. Yeah, the best word for it. So we go inside there. I've written down White Lodge, question mark. 
Yeah, I have that as well. <laughs> that's exactly that's what I've written. And there's, it shifts to black and white again. Once we're inside, we're back in black and white. Uh, there is an electrical sort of bell-shaped device, much like the one that was on top of the box from episode three. Right, again, we, we didn't have a name for it then either. I think we just called it a bell at that point too. Yeah, which is why, which is why I'm calling it that just now. Uh, and there's a, a gramophone, you know, old school, with a big, you know, the big speaker, loud, that looks yeah. like a horn. Uh, is playing constantly some old music, some old timey music, and there's a woman sitting there uh, on a sofa, just sort of enjoying the music, basically, just sitting there quietly. So it's one of these very Lynchian kind of moments where it's just a quiet scene, and it just sits yeah, there. Yeah, and she she's kind of just swaying gently. Yeah. Uh, it's, just want to go back to Cooper's first dream. Uh, the giant, uh, I think it was the giant, or the the, the dwarf. Sorry. Uh, well, it's the man from the other place. I've got the quote up. I know what you're going okay. to bring up. Okay, go on then. Oh, you can see if you want. You you as well. I was gonna say he says, uh, there, "There's always music where I'm from." That's not the exact quote. Well, that was. I'm paraphrasing. Well, no, there's, there's a reason why I'm picking you up on the mistake. Okay. Because it's relevant to another scene, which is why I wasn't going to bring it up yet. Okay. Um, I, I was waiting for a, a, a couple of minutes, but they, they. I'm going to come back to it. I'm going to come back to it when, right. I, when I think it's super relevant. Uh, but you're right. Yeah, the music's always playing, and. Then an alarm starts going off, brah, brah, you know, and yep. the woman gets looks concerned, and in what is almost the horror scene jump scare, the giant steps out from behind the bell. Yeah, he just he basically <laughs> just appears. He just walks out, and it's like kind of creepy. And he, he sort of walks up, sort of uh, center frame. He just sort of stands still and just kind of looks ahead. We get a close up of him. That goes back to the wide, and then he turns around and he you know fiddles with a button. Alarm goes off. But he's been alerted, whatever it is, because then he leaves. He walks back out behind the bell and out to another another room. Yes, a staircase. Yes, a staircase. Yeah, he goes down a staircase and into... Um, da, 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 I'm, just seeing if I, I'm just seeing if I missed any of my notes here. Uh, that's important. <laughs> uh, so then he's, he's walking down this giant room, and when he gets to the other end, it's clear that it's like a theatre. It's a stage. In fact, my, my first... Do you know what, the very first thing I wrote here about this, this location? Go on. I wrote... Silencio? Question mark. Hmm. I don't necessarily think Lynch is saying yeah. it's this place, but it reminded me so much of it. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. It was the little balcony uh, off yeah. to the right. Just that that posi- position of that balcony just really made me think of that theater from Holland Drive. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he's done that on purpose. Yeah, and plus all this black and white was making me think of Razorhead because that movie's in black and white. Like, so you know, lots of Lynchian things going through my head. Um. As he, as he enters, there's, uh, this new track plays, and I think it's a new composition. Uh, it's this beautiful, eerie track that gets... Uh, as the scene plays out, it gets really beautiful at times. It gets eerie again. It gets beautiful. Very ethereal, uh, yeah. I would describe it. Um, there's more bell-shaped devices. There's one in the middle of the room. There's one near the stage. Uh, again, more of these electrical things. Um, also, I, I, I forgot to mention, but when... Both both when we see the charcoal men uh, with Doppelcoop and then again for the convenience store, there is a le- an electrical noise. Like that, that happens both times. I just forgot yeah. to mention it. I, just, I don't want to uh, gloss over that. Um, so the giant steps in front of a screen, in front of the, the screen, and he just holds his hand up and it starts playing. It plays what we just seen. It plays the nuclear bomb, it plays the convenience store footage, and then it plays uh, the, the birth of Bob and it freezes on the birth of Bob but we see his face big giant still frame and the little globe thing he's in yeah uh, really cool stuff and he starts to float the giant starts to float and it's around this time that the woman starts to come in as well we see her coming down the big long big long room because there's no chairs or anything because it's like, it's like a theatre but there's no seats and yeah. she comes up to the the, the front. and as she's walking down the big room she looks up at the screen and I, I was being really attentive to her her reactions to everything because I, I, th- I think they're maybe perhaps the most telling elements of some of this uh, because when she sees the screen she sees the, the face of Bob she looks concerned, like she understands what's, what's wrong with this picture she understands that something is wrong something's bad is happening um, and, and I, I thought that was I thought that was interesting in itself, uh it's also worth mentioning as the giant floats, some lights start flashing. It's not, it's not too frequent, and it's not like like super violent strobing as we've seen when like villainous large characters have been abound. But there is a light that's kind of flashing. Yeah. Uh, important details. 
Uh, so the woman looks concerned, and then, but she looks up at the giant as gold s because it's still black and white, but the gold that's coming out of his mouth is gold. Yes. That's the one element of color on the screen, and there's like gold energy coming out of his mouth as he's floating in midair. And when she looks up at that, the woman looks relieved, like she, she it, in fact, she looks hopeful, like all is not hmm. lost. It's like she looks up and says, "Oh, it might be okay." We might have a solution to what's going on here. I think it's just it, this is it's a case of uh, restoring balance again. To go back to the the black and white lodge being in balance, perhaps. Yeah. Bob was an imbalance. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's like they've got an alert because this has happened. The bombs went off, and this you know Babylon has created this ultimate evil Bob, and the giant is doing something to counteract that. There's some something in balance that's happening, and he's floating there. Gold stuff's coming out of his mouth. She's looking hopeful, and the music is beautiful at this point. Like I, I was on the verge of tears. Like this, uh, this is the thing that, that's so great about this scene. This sequence is f- phenomenal, partly because of the music, partly because of the visuals, the black and white. But there's so much emotion in it, and you don't really know what's going on for a lot of it. There's a, obviously there's a moment coming up that kind of like solidifies oh, what's oh, happening. Oh, that's what this is. Yeah, yeah. But you're kind of getting parts of it. You're kind of understanding it enough to feel. But it's beautiful. Even taking away the meaning, there's like a, just a beauty element on the screen here. Well, that's it. Because e- even at this point, you're you're not quite understanding but like much like how mother it was coming out of her mouth and it was very you know it was this solid like it was almost a gas like shape but it was like a solid of it Mm. whereas this was this was still very gaseous it was kind of just floating out free and it was all particles of gold specks instead of this clump that we had from mother but it was very similar and out of this gold mist that's coming out of his mouth a ball kind of emerges from it and comes out. Again, all very beautiful music's very serene at this point. Uh, and it comes down to the woman. And the woman takes it in her hands. And she looks at it and she smiles. It's like she, again, she's hopeful. Like she sees hope in what she's holding in her hands. And she leans in to kiss it. And it's as the ball's coming towards her, we get to a close-up of her POV. Of what the ball is. I was not expecting the face of Laura Palmer. No, this changes things. This, the grin again. This is this is another. This is multiple times in this episode where a grin just appeared across my face. I I was beside myself with like happiness and possibilities and what this means and and I, I think what's genius about this is that this legitimately in a good way adds context to so much of what was happening in the original show. Yeah, I'll be very interested to see if we've read this the same way. Okay, well, I think that this is the birth of Laura's soul. That's what this ball is. This is Laura's soul, which has been created to counteract Bob. I agree with some of that. Okay, how have you read it? Again, I agree. It's definitely the creation of something to counteract Bob. Okay. But I don't think this is Laura Palmer as a human, as a person. Well, not as a person. I... I never said that. No, no, no. But like, I think this is, you know, the, the, the Laura that we've always seen in the lodge. Oh, uh, you know, in 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 the room. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if I don't think that was. I wonder if that was ever actually Laura. I wonder if that was this that just it, it it looks like her. And going back to that first dream of Cooper's, you know, she says, "Oh, you look like Laura Palmer." It's like, yeah, she does look like Laura Palmer. But and she says, "Oh, I'm her cousin." She's not. She she never says, "I am Laura Palmer." Oh, so I'm does. wondering if, well, she actually does. She she literally says those lines. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's she's not Laura Palmer as a person, is she? She's, that's she's that's something she's different. Um, I mean, possibly. I'm, I don't know if I actually agree that there's two completely separate entities here. Um, I think that this is the essence of Laura Palmer, and I think mm. it is going to Earth. I think because that, that's essentially what happens. She's the woman kisses it, and it goes into this thing that looks like a part of a brass instrument. Actually, that's just what it looks yeah, like. it looks like a horn. Yeah. Uh, and then it fires out into Earth, and it goes black and white into the screen, and goes down into that part of the US uh, where ultimately she's going to end up being. Uh, but obviously, we're still in the 1940s, and I think that's interesting. I think what that says to me is that he's not created a person. He can't just no. fathom a person out of thin air. He's created the essence of Laura, which presumably has to go to her parents, who will then have a child in which the essence will be in, and that's why we have that timeline. It's why. Yeah. She's not just there in 1945 all of a sudden. She has yeah, to yeah. still be created through no. regular biology. 
my problem with this, if if it's not a, a separate entity, is it, it for me it it somewhat undermines Laura's journey because it beco- it becomes now that that it this was you know she was destined to be this instead of her choosing to be it that like we saw like when we saw it in Firewalk with me it felt like she made the choice to do this it it was her doing something as a person is what ultimately led to you know all the other stuff that it did. Whereas here now it feels like it was predetermined and she was always supposed to do this. And for me, that takes away from the human choice of fighting Bob. I don't think I don't think it was predetermined. I, th- I think that's putting more elements into this than what it is. I think they created an essence that can fight her and it, or fight Bob. And here's why I like it. I like that it naturally ends up in the same family as where Bob is. It feels targeted. Like, it... it it found its way there. She found her way into that same family because that's where Bob was going to be. Um, now may- maybe Destiny takes away from some of the randomness of just that it's just a random person for you. And I kind of I get that. And in some other stories, I would complain about that because I-, I hate... Uh, look, there was a story in Spider-Man once in the comics. Uh, this is just the first example that comes to my head where they go, oh, it was always destined that you would be bit by the spider and you'd become the Spider-Man. And I'm like, no, I hate that. No, it was random. And that's what I like about it. In Twin Peaks, though, with, with everything that's going on, uh, this completely adds up to me. See, just for me, it undermines Laura as a person because it goes, you know, if, if she was the only one who could fight Bob, that's kind of what this is suggesting. She was the one who could do it. Whereas, it, it, to me, that, that takes away from her journey. It felt like anyone could do this. You know, like that if they made the right choice, they could have been the person to, to fight. They could have been the one to stand up. It was It was the idea of humanity versus this entity for me whereas here now it becomes it it, t- it just loses some of that oh i completely disagree i i i, I strongly completely disagree with everything you just said I, I i don't think it felt like humanity against bob at all i don't necessarily think she's the only one who can fight bob and by the way she failed she i mean she, she got out with her soul intact and she had kind of a bittersweet happy ending but she didn't win like bob was no, still but, there no but she was there like this this posits she was there to oppose Bob, like directly. And then, every, so if that was Laura, the person, you know, like you say, she she lost, she got out, but she was the only one who was supposed to be able to, which here, is why... Yeah, but here's the thing. It's not like she knew that. It's not like she had a card wire into her. I, th- I think part of what makes this so fascinating is that she's still just a fully functional person who doesn't know any of this. Yeah. It also maybe ties into why she has these extra, like, observant powers where she can sense things and she does have these dreams that connect her to the lodges and stuff um maybe cooper's also important in that way and that's why he has the dreams there's a, there's a reason for what why he has these connections to me it actually backs up why her why, why she does have like all these powers in the first place and the reason why cause she's, but she's still a regular person and that's why she was so self-destructive it's why she had all these problems like it, it adds all these things all this context to the original show and to bring up that quote that you you brought up earlier the actual quote when uh the the man from the other place said was uh she's filled with secrets where we're from the birds sing a pretty song and there's always music in the air it was where we're from and that's yeah. why I think that quote is so goddamn interesting. It's almost like, even back then, there was an idea of she came from this other place as well. Right, which is why I was thinking the one in the lodge is not Laura Palmer as the person. It's not the same entity at all. It's just, that's the equivalent. Like, it's almost like Laura was the host for this in the same way that something is a host for Bob, but oh, it sure. looks like her. Okay, sh- okay sure. No, I can, I can buy that Laura's a host for this entity, but... At the same time, I think what you're saying completely destroys the meaning of this scene. Mm. They send it to Earth, and it has to find where to go and all, all that kind of thing. I think everything you're saying completely kills what makes this scene interesting to me. All right. Uh, I think this scene's beautiful. I think this is one of the best scenes in the entire show. I think it's a great scene uh, when I'm watching it. it just... In fact, I think this might be the best episode of the show so far. I, I love this episode. I love this scene. I love everything this does for the show. I loved I it. I don't know about that. I loved it un- unquestionably. Mm, I, I was nearly, that. I was nearly crying during this scene. It was beautiful. This, this was art. To get pretentious for a second, this was art. I'm not disputing that. I'm just, I'm not sure I like the meaning of the art. Is 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 all? 
which doesn't take away from it like, like at all. I, I still think it's fantastically put together and like you say, the way it's done, okay. it is well, art, the way well, it's made. Let, let, let me counter some of your one of your points, right? So you're saying it takes away for you the humanity fighting Bob, right? Here's yeah. what I think it does to enrich that. She was so screwed up because, to an extent because she was a human. Because, like, ha- had she just been pure energy and she was never infected with a human being, it may not have been the same way. But she was so beaten down and, like, k- kind of a, a really troubled person because of interacting with all this stuff. It's, it's almost like this, like, they sent a being of, like, pure goodness, pure, pure light to battle the forces of darkness and it got corrupted by humanity. Or, if not by humanity, got corrupted by the, the presence of Bob and the presence of the evil so close to her. Like, that almost makes the struggle for her to actually make the right decision in the end. And it, it almost makes the that, that battle with, within her, where she's trying to do, make right choice, where, you know, where she's protecting Donna, she does eventually make the right choice to take control. Um, it, it, it turns this idea that the whole thing is this battle between good and evil. Uh, and it's why the idea of like having the, the regular person and the doppelganger and all the rest of it. In fact, this might even to me suggest that... Or, or, no, there, there, there is a lower doppelganger. That we definitely seen one in the season 2 finale. But Yeah, we did. Um, I don't know, this, this, is, this, this is fascinating stuff to me. See, uh, see I, uh, oh, it's definitely fascinating. I'm not disputing that. But what you, you said there about how you know her making the choice of, of good versus evil, it becomes larger it becomes not about the, the human duality of, of good and evil being wrapped up inside one person it literally becomes about another force influencing it and i just i don't know if i like what, all that why does that negate that though what why, why 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 does it technically being other forces as well mean that it's not about the human spirit deciding good or bad because she's still a person she's still a human being and everything around her is there's still people trying to like uh, like maybe the effect of her dying, the effect of what she had on this world, is what ultimately made lead Cooper to winning this fight. Right, but you, you know, you said, oh, she was making a, you know, when she when she made any decision, and it was about being good or not, and it, it feels like was she swayed in a direction, one way, uh, one way or the other, because of this thing now, or like I'm reading it, was it just as a, as a purely just as a human, was she? conflicted and had these emotions and and was that what was the driving force and her coming out on the side of good ultimately was to do with that as as a person she decided to be good or now i'm looking at going but was it this spirit this force that that edges her towards good and i can see the interest in that the idea of this spirit guiding humanity back towards goodness away from the again the horror of of this atomic bomb i can see the 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 interesting ideas in there i just i don't know if i like it for laura personally as her journey i think what i don't really get from this argument though is that you're really separating these two ideas in your head and i don't think they necessarily are i don't see why she isn't both the person but also has the spirit inside of her and i mean everyone has a spirit inside of them in this show like in, ter- in terms of like the, the context of the mythology we've built in this show because yeah. we've seen we've seen the spirit leave from the little kid like we've seen like yeah. everyone has these essences in here, the idea that this one came from the giant uh, is interesting to me. In fact, I, I did see one bit of speculation actually somewhere that uh, we never saw the giant in Firewalk with me, and someone speculated that maybe the reason for that is that because technically his essence was with Laura, and it wasn't until after she died that he started appearing again. Okay, I can see that. I mean, it it doesn't really flow with the the timey wimey nonsense. Because, you know, we, we've seen them show up here and where, everywhere, just, you know, whatever in time. Because the Lodge is different, so... Uh, have we saw the entities themselves time travel? All on the Charcoal Men. All on the Charcoal Men, which, right. do seem, which do seem separate to the okay. rest. Yeah, I'm not sure on that one. Yeah, yeah. it could be right. Um, but but to, to give us the same, I'm not, it's not that I'm separating them, it's that, yeah, the, this spirit is there, but unlike... A, a regular person's spirit, you know, like where it's just no, they are a person. This is directly influenced to go one way or the other. Whereas, so it's not just just a person's choice anymore. But here's the thing. Here's the, here's the thing, though. You, you, you're saying, oh, it's influenced, and I'm saying, what if it isn't? No, what if you just created a spirit? What 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 if the idea is that by default we we are good? 
and he created something that he knew wouldn't be corrupted, at least from, at this point in conception, and sent it to Earth. And he, here's the thing, though, right? Here's why I like this so much. I feel like so many people were probably, like, some people, maybe more casual viewers, were hoping, oh, Twin Peaks Season 3, I hope it's just like the old show where Cooper will talk about cherry pie and coffee and it'll be quirky and this. And he, here's what I think is so fascinating. Had someone else brought this back, had, had another creator said, oh, I'm going to do a, a new season of Twin Peaks to continue on, but David Lynch wasn't involved. Now, it might be good. They, they might turn out something that's entertaining. But here's, here's this weird thing about when someone else takes a property that's like, that was created by someone else and they're a fan of it. They maybe grew up a fan of it or they've been a fan of it for a long time. They're scared to change anything about what they like about it. Yeah. Whereas here, I feel like Lynch doesn't disrespect what the old show was. In fact, there's so many great moments that harken back to it that he clearly respects it oh, greatly. But he is not scared to say, no, 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 this is what the point of this new season is. This is what the point of this is. And to me... When I watched this scene, I didn't go, oh, this is uh, them retconning something. This is me going, this is what it always was, and I don't for a second doubt it. Oh, I, I'm not I'm not disputing that. I don't, it, it's not that maybe, maybe this always was his vision. And it's just for me personally, it changes how I am forced to interpret it. Because before there was an interpretation, yeah? That's how I saw what this was. And now I see this new information which I'm not seeing as a retcon, I'm seeing as just information we're okay, only just learning okay. but was always there, and it changes how it has to be read, and I'm not sure I like the new way that it's read. It's not that it's bad, I'm not going to say that at all, it's just it doesn't resonate with me personally as well as it did before. I was not prepared for this uh, this, <laughs> this ginger backlash. <laughs> like I said, I do not think this is bad at all like it's still okay, okay. phenomenally done like you said it is art absolutely and it is lynch's vision i respect that it's just i don't necessarily like it for me nothing about twin peaks feels random and i guess that why laura secretly always being important doesn't ring false to me because nothing in this world feels like it just happened by chance it felt like there was always something for both sides in some kind of battle. It always felt like there, there was a reason that goes back to something. Now we have the start of that, we have the atomic bomb. This is the, yeah. the inciting incident for everything that, that came about uh, going forward. And for me, this... It's like, no, no, now, now, now it's contextualised. Now, now, when I go back and rewatch seasons one and two, and I'm going to pick up on things, and I'm going to look at them a little bit differently, and I'm going to, and for me, that's fascinating for me that 25 years later, I can go back to that original show, and it doesn't feel like a cheap retcon, because I think that's, that's the danger with this, that a lot of creators, if it is, is a different creator especially, they try and put their stamp on it, and they, they do like a retcon yeah. or something. This feels so naturally set up to me, for, for everything that, that was there before. That right, it, that's it, but it, it makes... Laura into a a warrior of the of the White Lodge almost. Instead of and I get that uh, I get that's what they're saying it was and I'm uh, I'm okay with that. Don't be wrong. I get okay if that's the story going forward. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm just going to go right. That's yeah, what it is. Okay. How about this? What if it's not that she's a warrior for the White Lodge that she is actually to battle Bob? What if she is just a good soul that is there to help Leland fight Bob because something good in his life, a good person in his life. That can convince him to fight Bob himself, but unfortunately Leland was too weak and let Bob take over, which led to everything. Yeah, I just, the, I just don't like the idea of this good soul having to be created. Like, I just don't. It it doesn't ring true for me personally. It, before it was, you know, you just had a person, any person, who decided to be good. Whereas here now, it was created with the intention of being good. There's a that, that's the difference. Yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will be good, though. It, it could turn bad. Bad can turn good. Yeah, like no, one our man. For for all intents and purposes, it sounds like he was with Bob for a long time, and then eventually, you know, went yeah. to the good side. No, that, that's true. At least from what it sounds like, and you're discounting every other character. I don't discount every other character. Yeah, you are. You're saying, oh, she's only good because it was predestined that she would be good. What about everyone else? It's not that she's, but she was influenced to be good. Like that doesn't mean. But we see here that the good is the intention for this this soul. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
because it's pure to begin with, but that doesn't, like, that, that's like saying, oh, you're only good because your parents taught you to be good, so you were predestined to be good. No, you you, you have to learn right from wrong. Yeah. It has yeah, to come but... from somewhere. Your idea of good and bad has to come from something. Right, and, and I think that's, okay, you, you've kind of just hit on my problem, actually, right? That's, it's nature versus nurture. That there is, you have to be taught good and bad. It's nurture. You learn it. Whereas this here is is created, na- nature is created as good. And that's the difference. Whereas instead of being created neutral and then being imparted upon what is good and bad, we, uh, this is, no, you are created good and there you may learn bad, but that that's the difference. I just, I preferred it before, personally. But who, yeah, but who, who's to say that it is neutral to begin with? Much like, you know, there's light and then darkness is the absence of light, who's to say that bad only exists because good is corrupted? Okay, but if it, if it wasn't, if, if good didn't just, if, if not everyone was inherently good, why did they have to create one that was inherently good to fight Bob? Because Bob is more powerful, Bob's Bob's a greater evil. It's not, there's already bad in the world. Oh they're, yeah, They've already been, went through World War One and Two at this point. Is that yeah. like like years of Salem witch trials and everything else is as bad as ever happened in the world? You know what? Relatively speaking, the world was a much goddamn worse place before 1945 than it was after it, on average. On yeah, average. Yeah, on I'm not average. saying blanket, but on average. <laughs> That's fair. All right, we should wrap up this. this uh, yeah, we've still got the rest of the episode to th- th- about, th- This uh, friendly debate, I'll call it. Uh, yeah. Although I want to punch Connor on the face. That may or may not be... Um, <laughs> see, look. Bad corrupting good. That, that exact exact example of that. Aye, aye, very good. <laughs> well, regardless of Connor's weird interpretation that mess ruins the entire show for him, I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm hyperbolic. Shut up <laughs> before you start defending what I just said. Uh, I thought this whole thing was beautiful. I I was I, I was, oh, was I was nearly crying. I like everything. And I love that all of this was without any dialogue. It was just pure visual. You understood what was happening. It felt... And I love that it happened at the same time. As much as... I know you don't like the implication that she was this destined thing. I love that the spirit of Laura Palmer was created at the exact same time. Well, you know, give or take a few minutes. As Bob. Like, it was the counteraction. It was the yin-yang. It was for every action, there was a reaction. Yeah, because... and I, say, I, I do like parts of it. Like, like that, like you say, it's, I, I kept mentioning earlier, balance between the lodges. Um, balance, yeah. This, this is that it's restoring balance after Bob's creation. La- Laura Palmer is Godzilla. She's a creature of balance. <laughs> sure, let's go with that. But maybe she's balanced and never got to her potential because it was cut short, because... Leland was weak and let Bob take control, which ended our journey before it could properly get, you know, properly start. Which is maybe why so many people from the lodge are reaching out to Cooper, or had been re- reaching out to Cooper. He's like, all oh, right, he's he's the fallback for whatever reason. Mm. And maybe that'll be the ultimate uplifting thing. Maybe if Cooper isn't necessarily created from the White Lodge, maybe that's the inspirational thing. It's like, oh, the thing we created kind of failed, but someone succeeded anyway. I'd enjoy that. I'm curious to know in the comments where people stand on this. Like where people stand on the yeah, yeah. I because I, 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 I was not to fight this this much. I was not expecting your insane bullshit <laughs> at all. Well, I, was, see, I don't think it is insane. I was expecting it, you to come into this, and we were both going to gush over how great that scene was, and then you hit me with that. But you know what? It made for good discussion. So whatever. But still, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is the divide has been has been created here. <sighs> that that was our atomic bomb. What well, is funny though, I do think for people who were on the fence and were annoyed about this season so far, I think this was the episode where they leave. This oh, is the definitely. episode where they go. No, I... <laughs> yeah, and and I want to make it clear: in no way has that done that to me at all. Okay, good, good. Here's what I think is fascinating though. Uh, just to counteract that, is for me, this is the episode that said, "No, this is why it had to come back." This as as a piece of standalone art, and again I'm using that word, and it sounds pretentious when you use that word when you're talking about movies and TV because it sounds like you want to be a film snob and blah 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 blah. But for me, this is the thing where it's not just a return or continuation of Twin Peaks for the sake of having a continuation. This was no 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 no. Lynch and Frost had something to goddamn say, and this episode was them saying no 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 no. This this is the thing. This the and keep in mind we have ten episodes left. Oh, um, and and no, but this Oof. is the thing about art. Like like you say, this is art, yeah. und- undoubtedly. 
and they have something to say. But that doesn't mean I have to necessarily like what they're saying. Oh, sure. Well, this, 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 is, this is actually the... And I'm getting into a bit of a tangent here about uh, sort of mainstream movies and stuff here. But, you know, this idea of like making something for committee that will please as many people as possible is how you en- end up with really watered-down blockbusters where, oh, yeah, it was kind of fun, but it really doesn't leave any lasting impact. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to name any names or talk about formulas or anything, like for specific movies, but there's certainly some blockbusters you, you can look at and go, yeah, it was fine. Like, I had some fun. I laughed a few times. Some of the action scenes were good. But it was very much made to be inoffensive as possible. Yeah. And ultimately, I think the best movies, the best TV, the best art are the ones that dare to piss someone off. But they don't oh, stop absolutely. and go, oh, no, that might upset, like, a certain type of person. And, and obviously, there's. I'm not talking about, oh, we want to be, like, bigoted to, towards some group of people. I, I just mean, like... Uh, on a taste perspective, yeah, this is going to upset average folk who want a well, well, normal it, action it? story or whatever. By, by its nature, art will probably offend someone because art is evocative. Yeah, it should be. So it, it will make and someone it, feel something and not everyone will feel good. And if there's one thing you cannot say about this episode, you cannot tell me it wasn't evocative. Oh, absolutely. And which is why I'm, I'm not saying it's not art. I'm not saying it's not phenomenal. I'm not even like, I, I respect it. I just don't necessarily like it. The, 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 that's the difference. Do you think there was any importance to her kissing the... It was, it was like she was giving her a seal of approval and wishing it good well on its journey. Yeah, it was It was a final moment of just like a... Here's some interaction. Whereas, you know, like... Because from, from the giant, it just, it just forms. Just comes out of him. Whereas she physically just has an interaction with it. It's like, no, this is... You exist, almost. Right, I don't want to stick in the scene all of like for hours and hours but i do yeah. want to just ponder one more bit of speculation just to mm-hmm. and this was the one that would help your concerns or your Go personal on. feelings what if it isn't actually the soul of laura what if it's showing as laura's face because she represents what the, the ball actually is and it's them infusing the world with good in general okay so it's like hey you've reached peak badness here have some good back to balance it out yeah you you need to counterbalance what the worst of you have just created mm. kind of thing but to us as viewers because laura's kind of been the face of the whole thing and it's just it's the face of yeah. the victims of you know horrific acts and she ultimately is the victim of a horrific act uh, which by the way i actually kind of like that bob is the nuclear bomb personified <laughs> there's kind of yeah kind of do, you, do you know what okay if that is the case and uh, it could be and what i would d- like hey, is at some point gone. I was going to say, but if what I just said is right, I don't think it's ever going to say it one way or the other. I think that's up to you to interpret it that way. It is. It is. But do you know what I would love if it was right? If you know this, this we've seen golden ball imagery a few mm-hmm. times now. If one of them, we get Cooper's face reflected in it, just because then it'd be like, no, no, this was possible, but Cooper is the potential for good as well, as it wasn't just Laura Palmer. Oh sure. If we get that there, then then I'll be like, yeah, okay, no, I'll I'll decide to read it that way, and and I'll just go right. That's that. I'll who's make to, it feel better. Who's to say the giant wasn't spitting out these balls constantly for the next week, and there was like <laughs> lots of potential. Hope. That's true. That's true. I mean, the, the the fact that we only saw one would imply one. Yeah, you know, sure, but <laughs> one one for Bob, one for Laura. Balance. That's that's the key that we've been sticking but on. I think there was a lot of other things that were a lot of those eggs that were coming out of. Uh, of oh, Babylon, no, yeah. So, but Bob was the worst of it. Bob was the, and maybe that's the the point with Laura is that he's creating Laura because he has to make sure there's something that's as concentrated as Bob is. Sure, they'll be kicking out lots of these little eggs because that's yeah. what happens normally. It, it's, I think, it's why I was sticking on the idea of it not being Laura Palmer, but rather the the Lodge version of Laura Palmer, in the sense that Bob it didn't create a person; it created a spirit. And it was the same here, which is why I think I was sticking on that before this debate. Okay, sure. I, I think my only problem with that is, though, the why does it go to Earth? Uh, that that, no, that, no, that part a, feels weird to that me. That is a fair criticism. Uh, so, no. I mean, I, I think it's the soul of Laura Palmer, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. But let's uh, move this on. This is it. I'm, I'm not going to try yeah. and dispute it. Right, let's move on, because we're over an hour, and we've got like an old yeah. page or so on what's left to <laughs> go. Yeah. So... Then we go back to black and white, back to the same sort of desert location, and then the the year counter changes to 1956, August 5th, uh, New Mexico desert. 
Uh, no exact time, I don't think, on this. At least if I it liked, was, I note it down. Hmm. I liked how instead of just coming up with the, the, the year, it showed us what it was and then it rolled up. Well, this is what solidified for me that the stuff in the White Lodge, if that's where it was, wasn't like later. It was not, it was right then. Because, yeah, well, that was the same moment. Yeah, at, at the very least, it was the same year. Well, no, I, I think like the, the idea of you oh, know, no, we I, saw... I think it is the same moment, but I'm just yeah. saying, I think at the very least, you can... You, oh, yeah. Because yeah, of this timer, absolutely. it has to be the same it, year. It, yeah. It was, you know, in the that moment where we saw the explosion, it was basically frozen. It was moving so slowly. It was like all of this happened in this instant of explosion. Oh, yeah, I agree with that, yeah. Because it was, it was like we went into the explosion as it was happening, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree, I agree. Uh... <laughs> also, I'm... I can't remember what the line was, but there was a it was a moment in a Cole's office. It was when it was Albert and Tammy talking, and Albert was standing in front of the painting, and he said something about the something about the core of human existence. But he said it in front of that because I seen like an image of it earlier, and it made me right. go, "Oh!" It was just just thematically, he's had him say that line in front of that nuclear bomb mm. to just sort of hint at things. It's nice, um, but no. Uh, so so yeah, fifty six. 1956. Oh, geez, right. So this egg thing hatches eventually. So it's been 11 years and it hatches in the sand. And out comes what I have written down as a frog with wings. It's a, I think it's a frog crossed with a locust. Both are biblical plagues. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, that's, what, that's what they look like to it's me. It's funny. Then... I, I thought locust as well, actually. Yeah. Because I, 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 I was actually speculating, like, do I just not know what a locust looks like? And they have frog <laughs> legs. And then, then, then I looked up, like... You know, just like stuff on the internet. I'm like, no, no, I, I knew, no, I knew what a locust was. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, no. But no, obviously, with them both myself. being biblical plagues, uh, I, th- yeah, I no, yeah. think that was uh, an interesting combination of them. And they were introduced to two characters who are credited simply as 1956 boy and 1956 girl. No I'll names. Do. No names. Uh, so I think their identities may be important, and we're not ready to have that information. Uh, but it's a young couple walking home. Boys walking the girl home. They walk past a convenience store, although it's a different one. It's not the same one from uh, before. But I thought it was worth just just in case. No one. Uh, the girl finds a penny, uh, yes. and she mentions how because it's heads up, it's good luck. Uh, I thought this was first of all. It's not the first time I've seen a penny this season. No. Uh, first of all. Uh, and I, I, I also maybe wondered, like, is this Laura? Like, finding the coin? You know, not, 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 not the women's Laura. I mean, is the coin Laura? Like, right, okay. Uh, is, is that kind of the, because it's gold kind of thing? I don't know. Yeah, uh, sure. I don't know. It's a bit of a stretch, maybe. I'm probably just talking nonsense. A little bit, yeah. Uh, we then see a shadow figure land in the desert, which turns out to be a charcoal man. Uh, then another couple land as well. There's a, there's a fatter dude with a beard, and there's another one who we don't really see much of. But there's a main one. There's a main one who we see interact with various people uh, after this, uh, who is credited as the woodsman, which is interesting because he was in Firewalk with me. Yes. He was... Uh, and the funny thing is, and I remember watching Firewalk with me, and I don't know if I'd commented on it in the, the video, but I was like, yeah, Jür- Jürgen Prock now was a guy in, in the convenience store apartment, but... He was in like one scene, and I assume he's in the missing pieces. I assume they cut some of his material, but it was a fair, you know, it was an actor that I recognised. He was known. Mm. Yeah, you know, he was in Das Boot. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's a really well-known actor. Um, now, obviously, it's not him here. They've recast because you know, been a long time. Uh, but worth mentioning, this is someone who was in the st- above the store. Yes, assuming it's the same woodsman. As- assuming so, it was not charcoal in that though. Which I don't know if that implies that eventually some of the charcoal figures became non-charcoal, like they eventually formed into proper lodge spirits. Yeah, maybe they have to like earn their wings, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, because it seems like the the one that we've seen walking around in present day, he's maybe the last one who's still. Yeah, I think it's very notable how when we see in present day, there's just one, whereas yeah. before, you know, there's a whole swarm of them. It's almost like the memory of the atomic threat has dwindled since since nineteen forty. Because you know, during the Cold War, everyone. Got... Everyone could not shut up about nuclear bombs, and right. now today, like people don't even show up to the, like, the Senate hearings to talk about nuclear bomb safety and disposal. That's it. It's <laughs> it's not that it's not a danger because obviously it still is, but it's not the the ever present fear in society that it was. We're just used to it being a possibility, so we don't care anymore. Yeah, that and I guess we don't feel like tension. Typically, we don't feel like tensions are high enough for it to be you know, oh, fingers sure, on yeah. the burner at any moment. 
Yeah, that, that's that's all. So obviously, you had the, with the Cold War, there was like two sides that make start launching things. So you had that kind of threat. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. Uh, so, uh, what have I got written? So, they kind of wander out into a car, uh, into a road, and they stop a car with a couple in it. And there's some electrical noises again as they're walking around. There is some flashing that appears into this yeah. scene again, sort of tying in all these little elements of like the people from the lodger here, kind of thing. And he, <laughs> he he makes the guy roll down the window and he says, got a light. And he, he says it like seven times. Six. He, oh, very, very good. You counted. I didn't count. I just, I was ballparking. Well, and to be <laughs> fair, I was... Not bad, close. yeah. Uh, and I've just noted down after this, creepy as shit. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. The the electrical hum, it had the crackle in as well. It was mm. really loud throughout all this. It's it's also, it's distorting his voice. Like when he says, got a light, you, you don't really hear it coming from him. It just kind of comes out of here. It's almost like it, it's it's this separate noise that comes mm. out of there. Well, I'm sure it's very intentional with Lynch yeah. being on sound design. Exactly. Um. But yeah, so very creepy. Obviously, again, he's charcoal. He's covered in the black suit and uh, very, very unique look to him. Uh, it goes back to the young couple after this. Uh, they arrive at the girl's house and uh, some key key points here I've noted down, which may or may not be important, but I did, I did note them down. The girl knows that the boy lives near a school. Yes. And he's surprised that she knows that. And then she asks, like, weren't you with Mary? Uh, and he's like, no, that's not a thing anymore. And she asks if he's sad, and he says no. And I don't know if a this is maybe going to be relevant in any way, but I thought these are specific details about things that might be yeah, something. Yeah, it was the knowing that it was near a school. I was questioning immediately, like, was this mm. some sort of, you know, she just knows some things, or is it she perhaps just knows more than he realizes that you know, like it's it's something that she's just found out at some point. Possibly, possibly. Um. Yeah, I've noted in those credits, this is just boy and girl with the years. Uh, he asked to kiss her goodnight, she, then she lets him, and they, they have a sweet little moment, and she goes goes home. Uh, return to the woodsman, and he sees, like, you know, a, a radio station, and he sees the radio tower, specifically, which sort of, like, alerts him, and he, he goes out in that direction. He goes in, uh, I noticed that the timing of the, the scene started to play a little bit, as the, as the woman in the front of the radio station noticed him. Like when she turned around and seen him, it was like it started to go kind of slow motion, but kind of stuttery. It was like yeah, it definitely slowed down a bit. Yeah, it was having less effect on it. Uh, and then he violently squeezed her head until she died, and there was blood yeah, pouring down her face. Fantastic! It was brutal as shit. It was great. Um, we see some various things around the, the town. We see uh, the girl who's in her bedroom on bed listening to the radio. Uh, we see a diner, not not unlike the double R, but obviously a little bit different but yeah. very very similar kind of diner but called called pops called, called pops diner very uh riverdale of you yeah uh, and there's a woman there sort of cleaning up uh, sort of end of the night and we see a mechanic who's again doing some work end of the night and they're all listening to the radio they're all listening to the same same show that's uh, from the station kpjk radio yeah i never noted down the the name of the station but just knows? in case yeah just in case and the words mean goes into the the, the actual you know, booth and grabs the, the DJ, the, the radio host's head and starts to squeeze it. Although he doesn't quite die. I didn't actually realise until later on when it came back to him and then he fi- finally finished yeah, him. Yeah, you, you hear the crunch. So I assumed he was dead, yeah. Me too. But then it's like, oh, okay, maybe not. But, yeah, and again, all this is still in black and white. And by the way, I love just seeing the, 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 the kids, the, the young couple are walking around. They're like 14, 15, whatever age they are. And they're walking around out in the black and white imagery there's something about just putting it in black and white that helps with the eeriness of it. it. It does give it this weird, you know, ethereal vibe. I've used that word already in this video, but like I feel like it really sums well, up the feeling it's of because it. Because now, when someone uses black and white, it's a choice. Yeah. And it usually is to represent something either, you know, just old timey or it's a bit strange. Uh, well, it's an interesting thing here is that as much as it is a flashback and that's when we went to black and white, I don't think the decision is purely here because it's a flashback and it's no, I don't old times. Yeah. I just I just point out that's that's one of the most common times you'll see black and white these days in, in a modern production. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I just I love the feeling of them walking around at night uh, with the, the black and white and then you, you, know, you hear the, the chirping or whatever, you hear the owls maybe. Yeah. Uh, Do you know what I noticed that I'd never thought of before? Mm-hmm. The blood looks really dark when it's in black and white. It does, yeah. Like, I didn't realise just how dark it would come across. Joe, you know, you know I feel in black and white has actually, and I, 
this actually does remind me of Razorhead. It feels lonelier. Something about the world feels lonely. Yeah, it's the the absence of colour, isn't it? Yeah. There's there's no no joy in it. Um, and because again, because the world is actually in colour, black and white feels otherworldly. So it that naturally feels like oh something's not quite right. And you don't really feel that when you're watching like an old movie from the thirties and forties, but it just everything's in black and white and it's yeah, filmed normally. Yeah, but like I say, it's now when it's yeah. a choice. It's, something's missing. It's 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 the absence of something. In this case, it's, it's colour, but. In, in a direct sense, but usually it's more abstract than that. Like there's a, they're, they're saying something's missing from the world. So, so the woodsman turns off the music, flips a switch, grabs the mic, and he says the following on repeat. He said he, re- he repeats this. I'm glad I've... he repeated it because his voice again it's very distorted at times, and it took me a while to a few well, attempts to figure out some of the words. Second time I turned on the subs, so I, I know for sure I've got it. <laughs> I've got I, it. I'm pretty sure I've got it. This is the water, and this is the well. Drink full and descend. The horse is the white of the eye and dark within. I did get it. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and he kept saying that on repeat. And we see the effects of this. Basically, all the characters that we were, we, we sort of seen, the, you know, mechanic, diner, they all fall asleep. What I thought was notable is that the girl in the bedroom, uh, the young girl that we, you know, walked home with, she takes longer. She actually lasts longer than everyone else. She does. And also, I noticed that all the others seem to just drop whereas she actually makes the the conscious choice to lie down well it's not even just that she lies down she it looks like she's going for the radio to turn it off it's like she realizes something's wrong and she's going to turn it off mm, yeah. and it's, it's as she's sort of like reaching out that she's just sort of you know, dozes off and yeah goes into goes into her sleep uh, and this is and basically this is why it, this completely shattered the idea that the charcoal men were taking bob back out of protest or like you know out of like oh we, we're your keepers you're going back to prison kind of thing this is like no 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 the charcoal men are working for Bob. Yeah. Uh, at least, at least, if I interpret this right, and this could be wrong, but this bu- bug that's hatched, I think, is Bob. Yes. The bug sneaks into the the girl's bedroom. The girl's mouth opens, and he goes inside. And it makes us obviously start to question: Who are this? Who's the boy? And who's the girl? Who are these people? Now, I did some quick math in my head. <laughs> Okay. The ages are right for Leland and Sarah Palmer. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying for sure it's them, but the ages do roughly work out. Okay, because they were obviously what I was questioning as well. They were the, the obvious people to 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 assume it could be. And if this is Sarah Palmer, I think that's interesting that it went in her first. Yeah. That said, though, the thing that goes against this is I do remember Leland said that he saw Bob as a young boy. Uh, at like a, a, at the summer house or whatever it was, yeah. So that maybe goes against that, but it does make me wonder who is this woman first? If this is Bob, if it's not Bob, it doesn't make sense for it to be Laura because that feels kind of weird. Because because let's say the boy's not Leland, but this is Sarah before she meets Leland, right? Sure. Bob's separate, but this is where Laura went, and Laura's the bug for some reason, uh, and Laura goes into her, and that's why eventually when she gives birth to a child, it's Laura. Yeah, so it doesn't work for me because obviously, like I said, frog and locust—they're the yeah, biblical yeah. plagues. No, it's the, I, like, I, you know, they're, they're the ideas of the, the atrocities. I completely agree. I, I'm just putting it out there I, for. I was also thinking Bob, but I was thinking, yeah, you know how I mentioned that it felt like they were out of time where they were taking Bob out before. Mm-hmm. So were they literally taking Bob from the future and placing him in the world now again, giving him a second chance almost? Oh, wait, wait. When's now? You, you talk about 1956? Yes, now as in in the scene. Right, so... So when they took him in, you know, 2017 mm-hmm. or 2016, whatever year it's set, what, they took him and they went presumably back, in my in my it looked like they went back to 1945, right? Okay, okay. So then... There, what, what do they do with him? From uh, I'm going, well, maybe they got into this this creature, and that's how they've infected someone and going back into the world. All right, okay. So technically, timeline wise, at one point there was two bobs because yeah. it went back in time. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I can see it. Um, I will say that I'm not entirely convinced that he was. I mean, I like the idea that when they came and took him, it was timey wimey, and he went back in time. I'm not convinced that them moving around in front of the convenience store is evidence of that. No, no, it's not evidence. It's I, just 
to me that feels like that's just how they move kind of, yeah, like, kind yeah. of thing well, like i said it was yeah. really the the smoke that really set it off for me as well at the, when it came out in front of the convenience store and that all the smoke had appeared when they were taking it from no no I, I think i think your, your your path of logic makes sense i just don't necessarily think it's oh it's uh, yeah it's, sure. no, it's not a guarantee by any yeah. means it's a, it's a uh, theory so possible so so okay so one possibility is that they took bob back in time so up until when they took him back there was actually two bobs because bob went back in time and there was yeah. a second bob that opens a whole can of worms that i don't want to get into right now until yeah, we yeah. until we see evidence that there was like a second evil because then you go entity. Oh, what was what was the second bob doing was he just biding his time waiting for the moment where he could take over again or was know. he doing something um but it does make me wonder though because like so so bob was born in the atomic blast right yes and like mike is trying to get him back into the lodge and so on like we, at one point did he get captured will that be another story we see at some point in a flashback was how did they originally cap if they ever did like maybe maybe they didn't but like well, was no, it- I, think, I think you kind of hear there you said they're trying to get him back into the lodge not just get him into because he's never presumably he never was in the lodge for a permanent amount of time if they didn't capture him because if he was born unless he was born into the lodge i don't think he was it doesn't seem that way it doesn't does it it seems like he was born to earth yeah, it seems like he was born to earth and i wonder if he was t- or maybe he can just move in to and from and it's just the doppelgangers that he infects that because, 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 mm-hmm. you know, that's what Doppelkoop says. Like he, he's, those, he's the one that's come back to the lodge, which includes yeah. Bob. Uh, but yeah, but it, Bob, it, obviously, we saw he possessed Leland for you know however long outside of the lodge without problem. Yeah. Although we did see Mike trying to intervene and try to. Help. He tried. Yeah. Well, oh, that, that was another thing actually. A, a good little tidbit I saw online. Um, apparently, the the nuclear blast. One of the things that it did to some of the sand in new mexico is that it turned it into a green a green glass and it makes, makes you sense. think well but what about the the ring that was a green glass uh, okay. and I, I just was so you oh. think the ring was made from that moment as well yeah or at the very least it was like ta- you know it was taken from that location if nothing else yeah like it's a yeah. it's almost a link to that moment yeah 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 and that's it's why connected. it has power yeah yeah, yeah. i don't know i was that was oh, interesting. So it's, oh, that is interesting. Deep cut, deep cut, but uh, fasc- fascinating stuff. So, so is this? So we're going off on one on this one here, aren't we? Oh yeah, we're, we're hitting ninety minutes easy here. Uh, so, so is this? Is one of these characters? Is this Sarah Palmer? Is it? Or let's say, let's say this isn't Bob, right? Let's say Bob's already doing Out and stuff, about doing whatever. Yeah. All right, and let's say that is Leland, and Leland's already seen Bob. Yeah. Well, this is why if I was saying if this was Bob second that Bob. went back, yeah, second Bob, you can still have had the Bob that Leland saw, and have this one as well, the, because you know there there would be two then. Well, so you think a big twist this season might be that Sarah's got a Bob in her the whole time? Maybe. Maybe. That doesn't seem to add up, G- given the way she it, reacted to things throughout the entire season. No, seasons, no, maybe not. But but we know she. Again, we know that she could see things, and and well, before we were saying maybe that's how it was passed to Laura through well, her. Well, yeah. Well, I forgetting the bug, right? I, I don't think it's the yeah, bug okay. that's Laura, right? I I, I I pondered that idea for a second, just for the sake of it, just in it, case it, it, does, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. But going with the idea that the, the spirit of Laura can't just become a person instantly; it has to, still has to be born like a person. Yeah. So that idea that the spirit would go to her mother first, and that's why her mother had could see things and why she had these connections is because right, it was inside okay. her until and presumably there was still some left over there was still some remnants of that that's why she could still see bob you know in season one and stuff like there was yeah. still some of that left over but obviously the majority of it went to laura it went with her with the the good spirit mm. yeah no, I, i'm not disputing that yeah. that, that all uh, makes sense and lines up cool cool right oh and because for me the reason why i'm convinced of that part of it at least is because it that's why oh we see laura's face in this globe this ball this ball of light but she's not born until yeah 1977 or whatever <laughs> you, you try to 75 out, yeah. Just, 75 just, just, yeah just don't just don't try 
Yeah, 75, 76. I'd have been about then. Yeah. I'll do. Close but, enough. But but why then when it was set in, set in the 40s? Because it probably went to someone who was already just born. Yeah. I also think it was it was interesting that it skipped 11 years from these two moments. So, you know, what, what mm. was that spirit of Bob doing for 11 years? Hmm. Uh, and then if this if this was the Bob there, that not if this if, ignoring the second Bob idea that we've been mentioning, if this was this bug locust frog was just Bob, uh huh. Why did it take eleven years? Maybe it was waiting for the person that he wanted. Could be, could be. But you know, maybe maybe, maybe this girl just moved here, and it's like okay, the person I've been waiting on, someone who can actually house me. It's finally come. Yeah. Um, yeah, that works. Assuming that you had a specific target, because obviously the the radio does knock out everyone. Uh, yeah, so... it feels like, to me, I f- the way I was interpreting it was the radio was knocking out everyone and, and the, the, the bug was kind of going, right, who was the strongest? Who do I want as my host? And then it waited to... The, the girl, obviously, like you said, she was the strongest. She, she, she lasted, lasted the longest. The longest yeah. She tried to resist, but ultimately still failed. I think that's it. She... This person was the strongest that they can have, but will still be able which, to control. Which is why I kind of like the idea that it's uh, that it's Sarah Palmer, because because yeah. because Laura as well, she was even though she did have her weaknesses, but she was strong. She ultimately was strong willed. That's how she she eventually made the choices she did. But uh, I like that idea. But that that would be an interesting thing if Bob was in Sarah at one point. Like yeah. was you know was he in Sarah and then seen Laura and or did Laura's spirit seek out the same family that had connections to Bob because she had to be close kind of idea? I, I don't what know. if this is what corrupted Laura? You know, you we were talking about how it was created as good, but at some point was corrupted. Hmm. What if it was this this presence of Bob being in the same body, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, admittedly, that would just work even if it if it wasn't like if it was just in her father when they con- you know well, when they yeah. conceived her, and that that yeah. was why it infected her because obviously you know two parents. Well, yeah, we we don't really know exactly like you know because it always seemed like Bob was in and out of Leland, like he wasn't yeah. necessarily there the whole time. Unlike with Doc, well, yeah, yeah, he's ever present. Yeah, because if you well, if you remember, uh, he he showed up on and off until Leland let him in because that was that was the ultimate failure of Leland is that he said yes, you can come in. Yeah, uh, but but that, that's it. We we don't know at what point if he was there, you know, during conception. Yeah, we, yeah, we don't. Um, man, so much to chew on in this episode. It's, it was it's, a big one, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> undoubtedly. And then I think the, the the thing the charcoal man was saying, the woodsman. Uh, obviously, I mentioned a horse. We've seen a horse a few times in the show. It's been very symbolic. Uh, we do hear some horses at the end because the final moment. Because basically. After the bug goes into the girl's mouth, uh, and again, these two characters could end up being completely different people. Uh, that that we'll find out maybe more about them later. But, hell, for all we know, this is Philip Jeffrey's mom and dad. I don't know, maybe that's yeah. related. Just, but I was going to say, so uh, 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 after the bug is in the mouth, the woodsman knows that the job is done, so he yeah. leaves. Like he finishes because he realizes, okay, right it's finished I can go now and he just walks out into the night and that's when we get the credits because he just walks out into the darkness in the desert and then the credits just start playing but we do hear some horses in the distance I was just going to say he mentions you know that the horse is white right yes and the white horse was that that was the whole image that appeared to Sarah Palmer specifically he said the horse is the white of the eyes and dark right. within right but if the white horse is the, the that was the image that appeared to to Sarah Palmer, that was mm-hmm. that you know that whole big moment. So what if that was that there, but then the dark within is saying, you know, Bob, it, Bob's in there as well. <laughs> I don't know, I'm uh, reaching a bit. I, I agree, admit. I I mean, I, I'm not totally against your two Bobs because of time travel idea. Uh, <laughs> I'm going with it until they tell me otherwise. At this point, uh, I'm not. No, that's, that's probably the better, the better thing to do. Don't, I'm not. Don't, don't, don't you you are me. literally... Because, you know, I've had a glance online to see what people are saying. I have literally seen no one have this suggestion, which is right. why I'm thinking... So, so if it turns out uh, it is right, uh-huh. I get full credit for this. <laughs> if it turns out you're right, I, I will congratulate you on your fantastic <laughs> idea. And I, I do agree there are 
some some little things of evidence. Uh, yeah, it's not like I've pulled it from out of nowhere. There is something to suggest. I agree. It's a far stretch. It's probably bollocks. But what what I do like about the uh, the whole who is the girl, who's the boy, the bug is in the mouth. Like, yeah, the bug's probably Bob, but at the same time, we saw Bob in a globe of light, like we did yeah. Laura, and there was eggs coming out with him. So, what if what, this is one of those other things? Yeah, what if this is another thing from the lodge, another evil entity that's yeah. not quite Bob? But you know, what if it's Mike? Ah, that's a good point. You know, the eventual war on man. What if it's him? Oh, yeah, I didn't question that. Um, and as much as I can kind of mould it to say, all right, maybe it is Bob and maybe it's Sarah, I can't really make it fit perfectly. We don't have all the information yet to actually make all of it fit. Uh, oh. So as much as this episode answered kind of a lot in a lot of ways, it did open up a lot of new doors, and uh, I like that. So uh, let's wrap this up, because yeah, yeah. Uh, 90 plus minutes... Uh, oh, <laughs> that a, was a monster of a talk, wasn't on it? On a one-hour episode. Well, it's your fault for having weird opinions and arguing with me. Uh, <laughs> Alright, because 90 plus minutes wasn't enough, I had to <laughs> record a little insert just before the outro, because there was something else I wanted to talk about. So... Obviously, we've seen the fireplace room and the purple world in episode three with Cooper. And there it was kind of dangerous. Like, when he went into the room, it was all very stuttery and kind of... And we kind of associate that with some of the evil beings at this point. Where yes. it, so, the stuff's out of sync, things are not quite happening right. And then, of course, Mother Babylon, whatever you want to call her, banging on the door, this creature who's chasing after him. Whereas in 1945, when we see it with the giant and this other woman who we're, we're not sure who she is yet... I'm not sure who she is. Uh, like, it seems to be at least, if not the White Lodge itself, it's under control of beings of the White Lodge, of good. Yeah, and I mean, both of us put in our notes, White Lodge question mark. Yeah, and it makes me wonder if in the time, you know, from 1945 to present day, to, or 2016, whatever the year uh, the season's taking place in, like, has over that time, has the influence and power of of Babylon and the Black Lodge increased because of this new gateway? Like, because they're infecting the world more, have they taken over places that the White Lodge used to actually control? Yeah, that goes really nicely with our... Th you know, we've been talking about corrupting. You know, yeah. we, we talk about, you know, what what corrupted the, the, the good soul. And yeah. that, that would work nicely with this. And it would, again, it would play to the, the imbalance. Because, we, we, again, we've been talking a lot about balance between the, the White and Black Lodges. And this would suggest that you know, maybe the blacks got the the the, the upper hand right now. So yeah, in balance, and maybe that's why Bob won. It ma it makes me think that the blocks been, the the black lodge has been slowly winning for the last seventy years. Yeah, and you know, ultimately it turns it in like is the show ultimately about good versus evil, and evil's been winning for a long damn time. Good needs to finally. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's what what can good do to fight this? Because it hasn't clearly it hasn't been a sudden win. It's been slowly encroaching forward. It's been edging towards it. Yeah. So, you know, what can the good do to shift it back? Special Agent motherfucking Cooper. <laughs> but that is that is episode eight of Twin Peaks. Hell, hell, at least we got a meaty one. We've got no episode next week. Two so, weeks. So yeah, you got, you, this is two weeks worth. You got to get it in. Where also, you can. it's worth mentioning that remember the dispute where Lynch almost walked away. The dispute yeah. was is that Showtime only wanted nine episodes, and Lynch wanted eighteen. Had they got their way, we'd have one left. No, I'm not saying that this would have been episode eight had we only no, had no, nine. No, obviously this, but... this, this would like by extension been like episode what four. But I am in theory. I am so glad he got the time he wanted because I, I don't even know how he would fit this into eight nine. Uh, beautiful piece of filmmaking is what this was. That, that this absolutely. Oh, no, I loved it. I loved it. I can't I, I can only say that so many ways. So thank you very much for watching, guys. Let us know what you thought of the episode in the comments below. By all means, point out things that we maybe didn't mention or yeah. give us your own theories. Tell how stupid we are. Tell Connor how stupid he is. Uh, get us on Twitter, mail underscore fudge. Uh, individual Twitters are on the screen. If you like what, you, what we do, if you want to support us, head over to patreon.com slash TV. Check out some of the bonuses. But otherwise, guys, that is us. So thank you once again for watching this epic length review of one episode of Twin Peaks. We'll see you next time. Have you got any vanilla?